Hey there, my name is AJ Pickett and I love role-playing games. I upload twice a week with a live stream every weekend. I do a lot of viewer request vids and research the subjects to provide in-depth details, building an archive of videos to entertain, educate and preserve over 40 years of tabletop RPG history. For those of you who have backed my Kickstarter, I have dramatically awesome news. Stay tuned for more at the end of this video. I do a lot of requested videos and finally this week we get to one of the most interesting races you are likely to encounter in the lush tropical and subtropical wilderness of at least a couple of different worlds. Come with me as we make our way carefully through some dense old forest just past the mountains called the Small Teeth, south beyond the nation of Arm and Faerun. The cold mountain streams converge in the light woods of evergreens clinking to the slopes of mountains and carry on down into the huge forest where the countless cascades merge into deep rivers that wind their way far into the largest forest in eastern Faerun, the Wildath. Ostensibly a part of Tethir, but really it's a world of its own in here. The name Wildath is actually the elven word for unspoiled woods, and some of the massive trees found about 10 miles in were planted here by the elves after the fall of Mithranor nearly 800 years ago. Mostly evergreens, but there are plenty of oaks, cedars, duskwoods and maples. We walk softly and quietly, because not only are there dragons, hags, ogres, trolls and such about, but there's also the Lethari, lycanthropes of elven descent who are good and friendly folk, but, well, great pale wolves bounding out of the green can spook the hell out of some explorer with a loaded crossbow, but that's not who we are going to meet today. Following the course of a slow and winding river, jumping with rainbow trout and alive with dancing insects and birds on a cool afternoon, we start to see carvings on rocks and bright strips of cloth fluttering with every breath of wind. Our elven guide bids us to wait a while and goes first, making funny creaking sounds and vanishing into the tall ferns, sometime later reappearing and gesturing us to follow and be at peace. We're in a friendly place. The air is crisp and foggy. There are some strange smells, like little fire pits with smouldering charcoals and pots bubbling away with stews of what I am told is water chestnut, cattail and lotus roots, with bowls of berries and an assortment of spices from gathered all over the forest. There are tiles made of shells and tumbled semi-precious stones, and looking around the griply dwellings, most are made of artfully arranged mud bricks and carved wood, nestled under overhanging ledges or beneath the exposed roots of great trees. The mist and humidity condenses on tended fern fronds to drip in pleasantly arranged pools and pots, and the dings and blips and boops of water mixed with the bubble and babble of little rivulets, streams, creeks, the humming, chirping and croaking of the resident griply singing as they go about their day, even the caged crickets, cicadas, grasshoppers and katydids, which are part of their daily griply diet, add to this vibrant sound. It feels too wet and everything is a little bit slick. The griply smell a, a bit like boiled cabbage and all the furniture as such as there is is too small for humans and our elven guide, but Wow, the colours. The Griplies don't wear a lot of clothing, but those coming back from the river with fresh water lobster and all sorts of river plants have only simple loincloths that serve as belts to carry their tools. Those in the village wear bright ponchos with expertly crafted weaves, playfully adorned with pom-poms on wide-brimmed hoods. Scarves and leggings look warm and quite comfortable. All of it is plant textiles. I don't see any wool or leather anywhere, nor do I see any animals kept here other than the insects. Pots with tended plants and trees grow all sorts of fruits and vegetables. Young Gripley race along creeks just as readily as they leap and scamper along the pathways, running on all fours quite often while the adults peer at us over steaming pots, bowls of produce, weaving looms, musical instruments, cages of insect livestock, pet river birds and papyrus scrolls, all blank and stacked for trade with the elves I assume. We settle down around a central fire pit in the middle of the village, taking out some trade goods of our own just soaking in the sights and sounds. When a griply twice as large as any of the others I've seen lands right by us, I actually thought it flew out of the treetops. This one was quite impressive. I could see in the eyes that they were old, but not at all frail, and I certainly was not the first person of my kind that they had seen before. Our elven guide introduced us. They said this was Murguliap, and they related a long list of places and achievements, which rocked me back a bit. I glanced at the guide, who smiled back at me. He confirmed my suspicion. Yes, he is over 100 years old. There was so much I did not know about the frog folk, and I was eager to learn. 
The Gripply first appeared in the first set of TSR's monster cards printed in 1982. They were created by Brian Pitzer. Later, they featured in more detail in the second monster manual for first edition Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. The Gripply are an amphibian race, first encountered in the Greyhawk world setting, but they're also found in the Forgotten Realms, Mistara. We are about to immerse ourselves in some deeply nerdy lore, so grab yourself a tasty beverage and let's get to know the Gripply. Comparisons between the frog-like races are inevitable, so let's address the major differences between the most well-known types. The Grung are the most similar in that they resemble tropical tree frogs, however, they are a society of castes based on their lurid skin colours. They are smaller than the Gripply, but far more aggressive. Also, the Grung may be amphibians, but they're nowhere near as at home in the water as the Gripply. The Bullywugs are a lot larger than the Grung, or the Gripply, and they can actually breathe water or air while the Gripply can only hold their breath for about 20 minutes or so, and the Bullywug are faster swimmers. Bullywug are quite likely to target other humanoid races for murder, and have ref been referred to as Swamp Ninjas, and on the face of it, just looking at their stats, you would think that the Bullywug are clearly the dominant species who would have wiped out the Gripply long since now. But, though they are not as aggressive as the Grung or as dangerous as the Bullywug, the Gripply have a lifespan of 180 and that is quite a lot longer than the other amphibian races of frog folk. It's almost twice as long as a human. And the information on their lifespan is sourced from an article in Dragon Magazine issue 324, by the way, which provides a full ecology for the Gripply. Previously, they were listed as having a lifespan of 700 years, but they toned that down a bit. They're quite a lovely species that has two sub-races. The average Gripply stands about two and a half feet tall, with moist-looking but fairly dry skin of bright colours, lean limbs, very frog-like features, otherwise aside from the hands and feet which are more humanoid with opposable thumbs and a strong grip. They have very powerful leg muscles that enable them to perform staggering leaps of up to 30 feet horizontally or 20 feet vertically from a standing position, which from a human's point of view is pretty much like they can just fly short distances. One would assume that with, with that sort of agility they would make their home high up in the forest canopy, but usually they don't. Grung, by comparison, are short-limbed and squat with a much larger head, and they do tend to live up in the trees, though they can't leap quite as well as the Gripply can, and nor can the Bullywug, thankfully. The Bullywug have the extraordinary ability to communicate with frogs and toads. The Grung are naturally quite poisonous, but the Gripply, though very reluctant to deal with outsiders, do tend to get along with woodland elves, sylvan species, and tend to just get along peacefully wherever there is an opportunity to do so, and thus tend not to get hunted down and exterminated quite so often as the other amphibian races. Over a long period of time, this makes quite a significant difference to their evolutionary and cultural success. Their non-aggressive nature can be a disadvantage, as they just move out of an area where they're seriously threatened, and they have been known to just meekly surrender to slavery if something like a green dragon moves into their home turf and decides it wants them as its minions. But though many will get murdered by that dragon, they actually benefit as a whole thanks to the dragon driving off any other threatening predators that they may have had to deal with otherwise, so their meek acceptance is actually the wiser course of action in the long run. Well, maybe. Green dragons and black dragons who favour swamps and deep forests are not known to be the most reasonable creatures, nor to need much of an excuse to kill even quite compliant captive tribes. Gripply have long lifespans, and they live in a complex and at times very dangerous environment. They are highly attuned to their environment and get along well with the elves, who, if you know elven culture particularly well, will trade with the Gripply for the amazing colourful fabrics and artwork the Gripply make in exchange for the exquisitely crafted metal tools and weapons that the elves make, which the Gripply meticulously maintain and treat as prized heirlooms. A simple but beautiful enchanted dagger might have been with one particular Gripply family for many centuries, and their carved wooden artwork can be among a woodland elves' most favoured possessions. Gripply keep their villages small and everything is communal, even the raising of children. I was not aware that the group of children present in the village was quite a rare occurrence, as each female Gripply only has about six children in her life. Born from eggs, as one might expect, the Gripply keep well protected in hidden pools of fresh water where the eggs are kept. Since the females rarely lay eggs at the same time as each other, but groups of males may visit the spawning pools, the parentage of a Gripply is all about their matriarchal line, and all the males consider all children to potentially be their own child. So in effect, the children are raised by the entire village, and females are cherished as mothers to all. 
The females have only six children during their life as they become fertile once every 25 years after their 30th year. Females live a bit longer than the males and the older Gripply tend to lead the community. So normally that is a female who will have had a group of older males who are her mates and they handle all the decisions that which are not voted on by the whole community. Young Gripply mature slowly and learn a great deal about forest lore, hunting and foraging and the complex songs of their tribes. They accompany adults and are tutored by them, so the idea of a school education is a foreign concept to them. The Gripply reach adulthood at 30 years of age, and since children are few, they are defended fiercely by the Gripply if threatened, but otherwise the gentle frog folk prefer to avoid conflicts, and in the few instances where it appears that they, uh, they are instigating a fight, there will always be some very good reason why the Gripply feel like they have to be forced to take the most drastic action such as needless destruction of their habitat that leaves them no place to retreat to, or an industrial site that is poisoning an entire river system, and so on. Gripley will attempt to warn transgressors before they resort to violence, even so. I would not mistake their dislike of violence for a lack of combat ability though. They routinely hunt some of the most formidable giant insects, and particularly giant arachnids, who include Gripley in their diet. Plus, the very rare Gripply eggs are considered a great delicacy by lizard folk, yuan-ti, kobolds, and goblinoids. Though, the eating of adult Gripply flesh is forbidden among the reptile and serpent races due to certain diseases which affect them quite severely but are nothing more than a mild rash to a Gripply easily treated with some river plants. The Gripply are intelligent, patient, and very agile hunters who coordinated their concealed attacks to come from many directions. They are skilled with use of the short bow and the blowgun. They use nets and have very long and very strong tongues that they use to great effect in hand-to-hand -hand combat, along with finely crafted tridents constructed mainly of wood, bone, giant snake fangs, and woven flax cords. A group of Gripply will attack from cover, making a single bow attack per round, plus four to hit, usually within 80 feet or less, but their bows can fire up to 320 feet with a disadvantage. An arrow will inflict 1d6 plus 2 piercing damage with an additional 1d4 damage if the target has not seen where the Gripply attack is coming from. They leap to engage a target together, their tongues are plus 4 to hit and reach up to 5 feet. If they hit the target, it will be grappled by the tongue and restrained if the target fails the DC 12 strength or dexterity check to escape. Their trident can be hurled from up to 20 feet away with excellent accuracy or thrown from up to 60 feet maximum range. Mostly they use it in melee combat range as a versatile one or two handed weapon. It is plus four to hit and inflicts 1d6 plus two piercing damage one handed or 1d8 plus two with two hands and an additional 1d4 piercing damage if the Gripply has advantage on the attack roll, usually due to getting the drop on the target or because the target is already restrained by their tongue attack. A typical adult Gripply warrior has an armor class of 12 and from 6 to 21 with an average of 13 hit points. Their speed is 30 feet per round either on land, in trees or in the water, and they have a bonus of plus 4 to stealth and survival skills, plus 2 to athletics. Gripply don't have dark vision in 5th edition, but they certainly did in older editions of the game. Their challenge rating is 1 quarter and they very rarely attack alone. They always attempt to keep a safe distance and pepper a target with arrows, then finish it off quickly with a number of them restraining the target and stabbing it to death with their wicked tridents. Gripply are at home in the water or on the land, though they avoid deep open water. You may find one of their villages built out of and deep within the reed choked marshlands, floating above warm waters in a dense rainforest they may inhabit, a particularly huge sedentary treant. They prefer warm regions, but anywhere that there's plenty of vegetation and giant insects that they prefer to hunt, you might find them, far from humans and dwarves. The Gripply get along well with the elves, and most of them have never seen a halfling. They are naturally very wary of orcs, goblinoids, or any race that looks or behaves like them, and they will find reptilian or draconic races quite unacceptable in their villages, to the point of lodging a few arrows in the ground right at their feet, and a pretty clear message to not approach any closer. Naturally, Firbolg and Fey races are quite acceptable to them. They rarely encounter centaurs, but centaurs love Gripply cuisine and will trade handsomely for the rare herbs and spices, exotic fruits and medicines the Gripply will most happily trade with them. Those who attack a Gripply village might assume that all the Gripply have run away and the coast is clear to loot their meagre possessions. 
but the Gripply simply flee to the trees and rivers so that the most vulnerable in, in their number can get away safely. And when they are secure, the warriors will sneak back to the village and rain merry murder down on the invaders. Gripply have a reputation for not taking prisoners. They will leave one or two to escape and spread word that the frog folk are not easy targets. Gripply warriors and hunters tend to patrol via the trees or the rivers. They rarely make their way over long distances on the ground, so they are very hard to spot and even harder to track. Gripply at home are relaxed and happy. They may seem lazy at times, but they're just content to flow with the cycles and seasons of nature. Their spirituality is animistic. They consider the whole world to be alive and accord seasonal and celestial events great religious significance, marking such occasions with elaborate celebrations and ceremony which all tribe members participate in. There are a lot of celestial and seasonal events, so it may seem again that the Gripley spend most of their time either having some sort of a party or preparing for the next party, each of which usually culminates in a large offering heaped up around the communal fire pit such as the typical massive pile of pulped up insect flesh which is then blessed by the elders and tossed into the fire with the gripply dancing around the great plume of steam and smoke. It's not that uncommon for them to be joined by fey folk who also love to dance around in big circles. They're always welcomed by the gripply who consider their attendance a special blessing. The events also accompany by games and contests which strongly feature tasks the Gripply excel at but other races find very difficult, such as races to the top of towering trees and cliff dives into hazardous fast flowing river cascades, with the Gripply speeding downstream capturing fruit left in obstacle courses. Fun to watch but impossibly dangerous for those adventurers to participate in. Gripply language is throaty and guttural, with a huge range of clicks, croaks, rumbles and deep hums that I'm told carry very well underwater. I, it can be understood, but other races really can't speak it without magical assistance. Writing is taboo among all Gripply apart from priestesses, who know and read Undercommon, but are not allowed to write anything themselves, only the tribe mother may create any new records. The names of Gripply are singular, they don't have a family name, and they struggle to remember the names of non-Gripply. Day to day they don't speak names of each other since their skin patterns are so distinctive and individual they are the identity of the Gripply more than any name could be. It's said that a Gripply might walk by a human they just met if that human puts on a different set of clothing, or they might not recognise a particular elf until they hear that elf speak. Still, they do have names, and many take on nicknames after the fashion of outsiders such as Tree Skipper, Pond Diver, Deep Croak and Redback, or their Gripply name which will be Brobgulp, Kielum, Quoot and Labglip. Why do Gripply learn the Undercommon language? It could be tied to their hatred of giant spiders and Lolf, the Spider Queen, is certainly among the most evil goddesses they could think of. While the vital and living spirit of the wilderness and all creatures within it are personified as the goddess, not really a traditional deity concept in the usual game terms but oh so very powerful nonetheless. In earlier editions Gripley were quite suitable as player characters such as individuals who have lost their village to any number of monsters or monstrous peoples, including ignorant humans who see no distinction between them and the other amphibian races and set fire to forests to clear the land for farming, destroying the Gripley homelands. Gripply adventurers are most commonly rangers, they suffer no penalties for using exotic weapons such as nets and bowlers. They are nimble and quick but not very muscular, they figure out ways to avoid direct confrontation and exertion. They are excellent trackers and know just about everything there is to know about fighting giant spiders and snakes. In the very early appearances in the game lore, Gripply could possess psychic powers, so it's quite reasonable to bring their, that aspect back into your campaign world. They make fantastic mystic wilderness guides, adventuring companions, and their settlements provide welcome safe havens in the deepest wilderness, provided introductions are made via fae or elven characters or non-player characters whom the Gripply are more inclined to trust. The 5th edition listing for the Gripply is found in the new sourcebook titled Candlekeep Adventures, and they can be found in the D&D Beyond website as well. Hey, I have some exciting and very welcome news about the Big Pockets Kickstarter. The factory producing the high quality silicon tabletop gaming mats with the double sided grid and hex print 
has agreed to drop the minimum production quantity from 2,000 down to 500, which dramatically reduces the funding goal required, which means I will be setting up a new, shorter campaign with the focus on just getting the gaming mats in production and underway. If the existing backers continue with their interest, we are already funded. I'm super excited and I can't wait to get these mats into your hands. I've taken on a heap of great advice and suggestions thanks to the feedback from the backers, so I've tested the capabilities of the silicon mats to handle crazy abuse with every kind of crafting glue I could get my hands on that are commonly used for making miniatures and tabletop terrain for RPGs and wargaming. I have sent off mats to gaming groups to show them in actual use uh, on all sorts of gaming tables and I've listened to all the feedback about what exactly backers want. So the focus is really on those game mats and getting funded and having funding goals beyond that which feed the backer funds back into unlocking production of the other gaming mats, uh, the gaming sheets and hopefully the silicon DM screen designed to fit any laptop at the gaming table and to provide some more browsing privacy in public situations with for laptop users. So. We are all go, and these mats are getting made. <laughs> Keep watching for the announcement on the existing Kickstarter campaign that the new one has been launched, and it would be amazing to see that get instantly funded. Thanks for joining me today. It was a real pleasure taking a trip into the deep forest and getting to meet the Gripply. Thanks for the suggestion, and keep them coming in the comment section down below. Thank you for all the support. Thank you for all the subscribers and regulars on the live streams. We're your geek with pride, my friends, and I'll be back with more for you very soon.